Welcome to the two month review. This is Chad Post from Open Letter Books, and I'm joined by. Oh, Brian Wood. I thought you were going to do it. Just. just you, you do it this time. <laughs> I, I think I messed it up. Uh, go ahead and do it yourself this time. You like doing it that way anyway. Go ahead. Two month review. Chad Post from Open Brian Letter Books. Wood. I'm Brian Wood. <laughs> I'm here too. Hey, with Brian, and this is our, our weekly our weekly podcast in which we talk about a single book, or in this case, two books, um, by a particular author, bit by bit, section by section, enjoying them, appreciating them, creating a larger context for these works of literature. And this this season of the two month review is about Merce Rotoreda, Catalan author, one of the greatest authors of all time. And today we're going to be talking about the first six stories in the selected stories of Merce Rotoreda, which I believe we published in 2011. Um, but before we get into that, I have to say that we have, um, going on at Open Letter, we have our annual fundraising campaign, which you can give to by visiting openletterbooks.org and clicking on the donate button um, at the top, and you'll be taken to our crowdfunding campaign. Anything that you can give is fantastic, and we have a number of donors who have donated at a level in which they are going to be thanked on a podcast, so I'd like to thank John Wilson, Mark Cohen, Nick During, Elizabeth Denoma, <clears throat> John Powers, Hillary Dobell, William Johnson, uh, Jackie and John, well, Jackie Levine and John Borek, and I just want to give a special shout out to all of you. Thank you very much for for contributing to Open Letter and helping us produce podcasts such as this one and books and everything else. Okay, now onto the book itself. So, you read you read the stories. Do you have general first impressions? Uh, it's written by uh, someone with lady parts. I noticed. Um, <laughs> Merce wrote a rate. You're supposed to mention she's the greatest woman author because we need to separate these things out, right? <laughs> this is, yeah, this is a, something that was. This somebody brought up that she, she was like one of the greatest. Fe- I, I don't know who it was, but it doesn't really matter necessarily. Yep. They they made a distinction that she was one of the greatest female writers. I this is that, that was something that needed to be. Yep. Pointed <laughs> out or something. I think it happens all the time, and I think we don't even notice it. Like it happens a lot, where it's like, oh, this is the greatest woman writer from Germany, and you're like, well, it's. <laughs> It's like it's like yeah, you're the greatest writer from Rochester. Like it feels like that. Like it's diminutive in some sense. Yeah. Like and that yeah, it bugs me. It bugs me to no end, especially because she's like, she I'm is only, the I'm, author. I'm top 48 in Rochester. I just that, cracked it last week, actually. So I'm 40, 48 now. I believe that Rochester actually um, now is claiming that they're the 42nd most coolest city to live in 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 the United States. They didn't claim that. That's one of those like Business Weekly. Uh, clickbait articles. They love it. Yeah. They love it. That makes you click through each single picture <laughs> every time with a new ad. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, so Mercy Rotorita, female author, also greatest author from Catalan literature. You know, the biggest, it's interesting is aside from Ramon Yule, who's like the famous Catalan author, the other two big names that come up over and over again are Mercy Rotorita and Victor Catalan. And Victor Catalan was a... Um, Pseudonym for a female writer because she couldn't write as a woman at that point in time. Really, huh. it was like the the George Eliot sort of period. Yeah. Um, and so she chose the pseudonym Victor Catalan. I don't actually remember what her real name is because all the books are published under that pseudonym. Like Isaac Dennison, or everybody knows yeah. that, but not. But not not uh, Karen, Karen Von, Blixen. Von Count Blixen, whatever. Right. Exactly. Um, but anyway, so we had five stories, six stories for today, right? Um, yeah, do you know the time for like? Because I know you said you did these. Yeah. They're chronological. Chronologically, you know how early in her career? Yes, I do. Because I just wrote the post yesterday um, that went up last week. By the time you're listening to this, that's sort of the introduction to her. So she was born in 1908. In 1938, she put out a single novel called Aloma, um, which she had written some other novels, but I think she sort of dismissed them or thought they were like juvenilia, crap, whatever. Uh-huh. Um, Aloma came out. The Spanish Civil War is going on. She was working for the government. After Franco wins the Spanish Civil War, she and her husband and her family fled, and they went to Paris, but then Nazis, and then uh, ended up in Switzerland, <laughs> and ended up back in France later on, and then back in Catalan, um, in Catalonia after that. But um, so between 1938 and 1958, she published nothing. And oh, then when she was God. in Geneva, she brought out the collection 20, it's like, Venti Dos um, is, or however you say it, or however the Catalan accent, but it's 22 stories. And these stories, almost all the stories in this book are from 22 stories, that book that came out in 1958. Okay. Um, and I believe, we say we arrange them chronologically. I 
believe that that is true because I think that in the 22 stories, they're dated. Okay. Um, but we didn't include the dates. Okay. Um, but then as you go through the book, so the first 20 so stories in like here. 30, 40s. Like she was, yeah, I would say 30, 40. Okay. Yeah. And so the first 20 stories in this collection are all from 22 stories. And then there's seven of them that are from a later volume that came out in the 70s and then the last ones the last three are from a book that came out in the late 70s early 80s and that was like her final short story collection yeah Yeah, because i I tried really hard to make sure i I wanted to read these fairly naive because i didn't want to i i had one instructor that always like he would when doing short stories he had this phrase says uh don't queer the text where like if you know the writer's gay you're gonna Uh look for like yeah. Oh, that, that's a, that's that signifies gay. That's gay. That's like like don't queer the text. Just read it. Yeah. And it is what it is. And like I was trying not to be like, well, is there like a revolution in here? Right. Am I trying? You know, was she struggling as as a woman being repressed at this time? I just wanted to read it and see what kind of rose to the surface. Um, right. So I, I tried, and I guess the thing I got from these first stories was there's the word terrible everywhere throughout it. It's like terrible feelings, terrible weights, terrible this and that. There's right. Like this dysfunction with uh, partners throughout it. Oh, really quiet. And yeah, very like just desperate. internal. Yeah, desperate yeah. and caged. And then there's death and frailty and then industry. And a lot of gardening. Of, yeah, a lot of gardening. But, but yeah, from the first, uh, I mean, that's all that's right there in the first story, uh, Blood, I think it's called, yep. right? Yep. Um, and then I found it throughout. The, the other ones as well was kind of a, a thread that a sewing needle might pull through all of these <laughs> to create a string of pearls. Um, no, I, I noticed those same kind of things yeah. uh, popping up. Oh, absolutely. These are, they remind me, these stories in particular, well, one thing related to that, the only thing that seemed to come through on her from her personal life aside from I don't know there's not there's no bio in English that I'm aware of about her life and there's like a an essay by Gabriel Garcia Marquez in which he references that she was like a very private individual and didn't not a lot of people knew about her personal mm-hmm. life so which is kind of fascinating I'll, I'll bet there's like interesting uh, interesting book to be told or be written out of that but um the only part of her life that seems to be reflected in here is that the setting switches to paris yeah I noticed um that. very and like after the second or third story and i feel like those are probably stories she's writing in paris when yeah. they were first there um there is yeah, one sudden, there's a it goes from you know there's mademoiselles all of a sudden yep. and... yeah and she's talking about the arrondissements and like which ca- trying to cut them up there is one thing that it's that very harshly too when you think about um the type of fabrics and how like, right. nice and like the, the supreme luxury all of a sudden. That's, that's true. That's so foreign compared to in that first story where it's your hands in the dirt and yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. There does there's a switch in like class. It seems like yeah, in yeah, a yeah. sense. I thought like the, the thing that they remind me of is um, Kate Chopin's The Awakening. Like that sort of that era of writing in general of like of, of women's writing. I'm going to say women's writing in this case because I think that women really did write a lot about this and like Natalie Siro who I mentioned in the last podcast where it's like trying to represent the internal uh being the internal the internal person um an eternal woman especially in this case and like how they come to awareness of things and so there's always like in a lot of these stories there's sort of an amorphous feeling and like when you're saying terrible like there's a terrible feeling like in um the story where she talks about leaving her husband which is uh all of them happiness <laughs> yeah hey the last one happiness <laughs> all of them literally um the mirror too where the mirror is, the mirror I think is the best of these bunch for me, um, but or the most like crafted. But happiness, where she's talking about leaving her husband, like she's really happy with him, and he gives gets in the shower, and suddenly she has this like vague sense that like it's over. She says it's over. She thought love is ending, and this is how it ends quietly. The more she imagined him calmly under the shower, the angrier she became. She would leave him. She would see her. She could see herself packing her bags, and there's like that sort of sense where it's not fully formed, but like a, that, that sort of emotion that you kind of feel and experience and then a lot of these stories are trying to kind of put that figure that out yeah so did you enjoy reading these as a a newlywed (laughs) (laughs) i had no problem with it other people read some of these stories and were like i'm having an anxiety attack (laughs) it does give you this anxious feeling like it's hard to catch your breath sometimes because it's this this wonderful trap of 
a, a domestic life that yeah. just like you're drowning in just simple, easy things. Like it's it's terrifying because it, like it, there's no panic or escape, but you're supposed to be happy. It's like like a man's supposed tender love. Like stop being so nice and tender to me. I'm freaking going crazy here. What's <laughs> wrong with like stuff? Like it's like oh uh, yeah, incredible. Or like the first one, like trying to describe what it's like to be menopausal and like. <laughs> And that's that's one where she's like, I I got old. I noticed my knees, and that that's that's wonderful detail. Yeah, that was so concrete and perfect. The Loved it. Loved the it. last line of happiness sort of sums this all up too. I, happiness wasn't my favorite, but like I keep going back to it. Um, the very last line is, "What remained, all curled up, was a girl without troubles, without agitation, a girl unaware that she was tyrannically imprisoned within four walls and a ceiling of tenderness." Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's just like, that sums up everything we just said. I feel she like in one really, like. Yeah. She is brutal and amazing. I liked I, my favorite was the mirror though because it was so intricate in terms of like telling the story of how she had this. She lost her virginity to this guy who then didn't come back, and she gets pregnant from with his baby, and then she gets at a dance and meets another man who ends up being her husband. Who like they hate each other because he knows that 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 the child is not his, and she rubs it in his face, and then like yeah. and she hates her child because her child reminds him of this guy who left her, and it's just. Fun. Insane and brutal. You know what they say: once you go Roger, you don't don't go back. <laughs> I don't know. There's not a good rhyme with Roger. That's true. Edited Dodger, you can't do, can't you can't Dodger after you've gone Roger. No, no. That doesn't work. No, no. Nah, okay, nah, screw it. Once you get that hot Roger action, it's <laughs> over, man. Roger, Roger, be slanging that. <laughs> Dude, were there any things like? What's interesting too is like it is so specific and like pointed and and. And we could go into any of these individual stories, but they have like a lot of that that guilt, all the things that we're talking about. Um, and the translations seem very precise. And yeah. I and I know that that Martha put a lot of time into translating this book. She got, I believe, she got an NEA grant for it as well. Um, but it's it's it, it's it's a lot of time, a lot of precision. And I don't know that in the original, like I think that there's a lot of things that she did. I know that this will come up in Death and Spring that she sort of invented new yeah. words or new new terms. Well, just from like a, a craft standpoint, on the line level, it felt tremendously toiled, like worked really hard. Yeah. Kind of like not in the sense of like for Hemingway, where it feels like a chiseled block. And uh, right, right. You're building like a wall, block by block by block, and it's so so freaking worked and precise and crafted. But it felt this felt very crafted, very tailored. Yeah, like work really hard. There's no extra words, right? And stuff. It's just really, really lean and tight and terse, which I think is great for that anxiety feeling you're getting. Oh, absolutely. Uh, These are really like very, very sharp little pointed. The moments. first one I noticed though, to me, it felt the most juvenile of all of them. And juvenile yeah. is not even the right word because right. it's still just young in her career. I feel like it because it still felt like it was, it was frustrating because it's still like super good super accomplished I would love to be able to write this well and it's I can tell it's not her best it, I, it's so frustrating that somebody can be that good and not be at their best you know what the difference is so blood that we're talking about blood yeah. and then comparing blood to framing, the mirror it has a weird framing it's just device. her telling the story and later there's no reason for it I, I couldn't figure out what the reason for it was and it drew me out of the story because who who would tell a story in dialogue with that type of precision and detail? And, you know, I mean, it's not real. So the, yeah, so the setup is that this woman's just telling the story about like, like she's talking to. Uh, well, no, no, we're, really we're hearing that the, the yeah. narrator is hearing someone tell her where it begins to like see this. She said to me, "Every year, my husband punted Dal- is it Dahlias, Dahlias in this Dahlias. Dahlias in this empty basket, and then goes on for eight, ten pages." So this person that the story was told to remembers it with that level, level of precision. Of this is totally feels weird. like this totally feels like a trick to like get yourself to be able to write. Yeah, like but like, she has like this story, but like that like, compared to I, the mirror. How do I get it to be told? Or like it's just, yeah, it's an unnecessary framing device i felt and yeah like to me it made it feel like it was the way of freeing yourself to be able to write the story the way you wanted to or just write a story yeah and as a reader it kind of drew me out like who's gonna remember you know the earth running through her fingers trembling as you know i'm Uh, making that up but um, yeah yeah i know what you mean although tell a story like that why like so many uh, fiction has that like hemingway does this like when he like in sun also rises is recounting like all these specific conversations that people had in this bar where they were like just sloshed like like, nope (laughs) like not you're probably (laughs) saying like (laughs) (laughs) give me more um he seems like a guy that would cry it would be drunk and just end up crying by himself somewhere (laughs) 
And then later, act like, yeah, I've got an eight inch dick. I'm awesome. I'm like, you were crying, pissing yourself, really. What are you talking about? Yeah. So assuming that she's so assuming that she was writing this story because this is one of the ones that's set in Barcelona, I believe, or like seems to be Spain and pre pre their moving. Yeah, it talks about the Rambles in here. Yeah, the Rambles. God damn it. Um, <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> like when there's like, I really wish it was La, Las Ramblas or La Rambla, not the Rambla. I don't know how that happened. Whatever, whatever. I'm gonna let it go. Anyways, yeah, she talks about that. So this is a Barcelona story. So let's assume that this was written in the mid '30s because she has her novel that comes out. This is uh-huh. around that time. So other people that are writing at the time, that's like Finnegan's Wake period, um, end of Gertrude Stein, like stuff like that. There, and I don't my my, I know a lot of authors. And a lot of timelines, but this is like a vague point for me. Like, was who else was writing like this at that point? That were like this sort of like uh, eternal, uh, like granting like women this sort of voice and this sort of like experience. Like there had been like the the Virginia Austin Woolf Virginia Woolf that, is a little bit before, but yeah, for absolutely you tell your side of the story. And, and I think her big influence was Woolf and Proust. I was gonna say because I felt there was a a quote I remember from. Virginia Woolf, where she describes like carving out little caves behind her characters and then connecting them. And I felt with this, like you could definitely feel that kind of carving yeah. out that space behind the surface. And yeah. Getting it like it was really, really cool. But yeah, even with this, like it's it's almost like it's all there and it's ready to happen. Like with the relationship between the husband and mm-hmm. then the younger woman gets introduced into it then there's the competition and then yeah. there's the anxiety and then she starts kind oh, of going God. crazy and anxiety is like she's like I didn't know seeing ghosts yeah you know thinking the, her well, husband's tricking her that was intense yeah. like we should actually talk about that so, too but, like, she wants to go there but then there's this dumb framing device that's slapped onto it that like it's almost like she didn't have the confidence or wasn't allowed well, to go there yet like yeah because if she just went full bore and went for it on this it would be so amazing it's all I think there. she does that in like the mirror I think yeah, the mirror the is mirror, that you can start feeling like get that stride that mm-hmm. confidence and it, that's what's so frustrating that like even young even like early on she's still so freaking good it's yeah. really annoying and I don't feel like these stories although they have they are specific to their time in some sense and into the sensibilities a little bit with like people spend all night sewing but they have aspirations of like starting their own sewing company whatever or like a yeah. tailor shop whatever you call it, it seamstress made me wonder what her writing habit was like was she working did she have to work full time and then write it Right at night, a candlelight or something. Someone because... wrote. Someone, if, if maybe the the Institute Merce Rotorata funded uh, <laughs> someone to write a biography that would like popularize Merce Rotorata and you know bring her through. Oh, you know what? Actually, what we should do is we should we should talk to someone about this. We should call Kim Manzo, and uh, since we publish him, he's a Catalan author. Maybe we can get him on the phone, and he can give us some insight into Rotorata's background and what her impact was in Catalan. Does he speak English? Because I don't speak anything but bad English. I think he speaks English well <laughs> enough. Okay. And he also, like, whatever. He can speak in Spanish if he wants to. We'll just understand it. It's <laughs> fine. We'll, well be ha- good. You guys ha- all listen to Spanish. Ha- half you know my it. conversations, I just nod and go, uh-huh, anyway. So it doesn't really matter one way or the other, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that'd well, be awesome. Yeah, call him up, man. Okay, I'll dive him right now. Hey, Kim, thank you for, for taking our call and for, for coming on, agreeing to come on here to talk about Merce Rotorera's work. Um, for anyone who doesn't know... Kimanzo is the author of it's how many stories have you written now? It's well over a hundred. Yeah, uh, in uh, Germany they published uh, one uh, one hundred uh, eight years ago or eight or, or nine years ago. So now uh, probably one hundred thirty or something like that. Man, so yes, a, a number of a few of the collections have come out in English. We Open Letter published Guadalajara and A Thousand Morons. We have another one coming in uh, next year or two. Um, I, I don't remember what title that's going the, by. The title is the title of, of that collection. Yeah, is El Perquet de Tot Plegat. Uh, I don't know how it should be translated. Uh, maybe the, the why of it all, or, or, or I don't know. I think that is what I think that's what Peter Peter Bush is trying to say. I think he did have something like the why of it all, but I think he also said like I'm not certain this is the best option. But that that's coming. We have a novel, Gasoline. You also have the Enormity of the Tragedy was published by Peter Owen a few years back, um, and O'Clock well before that. Um, and you've also gone on. You write a column, daily column, I believe, for the newspaper, right? And yeah, a daily column. Yeah, and you it's have a art. new. 
What's that? It's hard. It's hard. It's a hard uh, work. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Because I don't write about politics. So uh, if you write columns about the ordinary life, the the things that uh, shock me. Uh, And, and you have to do this every day. It's more difficult than writing about, well, that politician is uh, shit and that other politician is great. And uh, a few days later, say uh, the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, those kind of write themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We do, and I do want to talk about Catalan politics in a minute, but um, also, like, I want to say I was just in Barcelona last month, and we saw the picture of your new book, um, which has a, I'll po post it with this thing, which uh, you're sitting in a, with a, like a cook's outfit on, like a chef, and a giant boar's head over your crotch. No, no, no not a giant, it was a usual, a usual uh, hawk. Oh, uh, a usual size uh, hawk. We, <laughs> yeah, we, we bought it from a, a butcher uh, shop. <laughs> it's an amazing <laughs> cover, it's like... It's, we have to use that as your author photo for the next yeah, book. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but anyways, um, aside from that, so we're this this podcast this season, we're talking all about Merce Rodoreda um, and her influence on writing generally. And we started by reading a few of the stories from 22 stories, uh, which are included in the selected stories that we published a number of years ago. And I was wondering if you, what's your feeling about Merce Rodoreda and what, did she influence your writing in any way? Well, I, I, I would... Uh, I would love so, uh, but the problem is that uh, here, when I was uh, young, I was a child, I was uh, a teenager. We don't get, we didn't get uh, Catalan literature at school. Catalan was uh, forbidden, so we read uh, books we, we found. At, uh, at, at, at bookshops, and I was uh, reading Rodoreda, and I began reading her short stories because I love her short stories. Then I w go on and, and began reading her novels, but her short stories are wonderful. Uh, this one, the 22 short stories, I think it, it is, and there's another one which is called La Meva Cristina y Altres Contes, right. which can be translated by the My Cristina and other short stories. And uh, Because she has the, the, the power, like, I don't know, like a uh, Uh, Cortázar or, 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 or a lot of uh, Latin American uh, writers to to know what is a short story is is something short where you have to use the words that you need to express the idea, but not a word more than the necessary. Uh, and and she did it wonderfully. Yeah, there's a real there's a real precision to these stories as we've been reading and talking about them. That they're they're very lean, um, very tight. There's not a lot of excess. Even in her earliest stories, I mean, they're they're well constructed and in a way that you don't see very often. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, and they are very funny uh, because she was subtle. She w wasn't pushing you, pushing the the the, the, the reader to, to 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 adopt or to get any idea, but she let you uh, go on on and have your own own idea uh, about uh, her writing. Yeah, I hadn't thought about the fact that like that that you'd have grown up in the time when when. Uh, Catalan as a language wasn't really taught in schools or wasn't allowed to be taught and was like more or less banned and that these books wouldn't have been accessible which is it's crazy to think about in like such recent history um, yeah but, but, but I was born in 1952 so I spent my uh, 20 maybe 24 25 years The first 24, 25 years of my life under Franco. So uh, this was it. Uh, Catalan was nothing. 
and well uh, now <laughs> I, I I hope it will it will not get back. It will we he we uh, will not get back from her grave, but uh, politically here uh, you can suspect he has uh, pull out the 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 the, the, tombs, uh, the tombstone uh, or, or the grave or whatever, and he's uh, he can see you walking in the streets. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, I always heard that like the that Barcelona like the soccer team became very popular in part because that was the only place that you could speak Catalan during the Franco period. What Barcelona? Yeah. Well, no, Catalonia. Barcelona, uh, of, of course, it, it is uh, the capital of the, of this country. But uh, well, uh, people spoke Catalan. Uh, but not uh, uh, when you went to a, to a police station or to a government, I don't know, desk to ask for a paper you needed for this or that. Well, no, hablame uh, in cristiano. Talk me in Christian, they say. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, Christian meaning Spanish. Right, right. Absolutely. Hablame uh, in cristiano. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but, but, but those are all stories. I hope, and well, life has been going on. Yeah, what is your what is your feeling about the about the independence vote? My opinion, uh, seriously. Yeah, uh, I, I uh, <laughs> I'm for it. I, I I want it, but it's hard to 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 get it because there's no. Well, there's no, 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 there are little possibilities, but well, that will, that won't change my mind. Uh, if I, if we get it, uh, it will be perfect. If not, we will go on and on as we have uh, been going on for some centuries. And centuries. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. My, my English is awful. I'm sorry. No, your English is great. It's much, much better hey, than my. Come on. <laughs> it is. No, it's it, just spectacular. To me, it's not, to me, no, it's not. It's awful. <laughs> it's, it's, I, think it's, I think it's quite good. I think it's interesting. One of the things that, that I really like about being in, in, Catal- in Catalonia and uh, aside from, aside from tapas, uh, wine, and uh, paella. The other thing was like with the Catalan literature, like how many how many great older writers that there are that are all women. Like Victor Catalan came up a lot, Merce Rodoreda comes up a lot. Um, very interesting that there that sort of the foundational texts in Catalan are from these great women writers. The, uh, I didn't understood. I didn't understand your question. You mean which other writers of value? Uh, Victor Victor Catalan. Um, yeah. she kept coming up when we were there in, in Barcelona. And I, I just love that. Like, it's interesting that two of the foundational writers that everyone kept pointing to that needed to be read or talked about were two famous women writers. Few women, right? No, there, there's been a lot. There's, there's, but we, there's been uh, a, a lot of women writers now. Uh, and then, of course, uh, some decades ago, there were more men, uh, even now. But but uh, now, uh, literature, uh, poetry, and fiction uh, are on women's hand mainly. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what, and and it's great because it's like I don't know who you connect Rodoreda to at the time that she was writing. She reminds me a lot of uh, both. Kate Chopin, the American writer, but also Natalie Sirot, um, where she has like a this sort of internal dialogue, maybe Clarice Lispector to a degree too. But uh, she's from that that era of like really grand, amazing, amazing writers, and it's great to be able to to be to be reading her and talking about her. And I assume that she's still popular in in Catalonia today, right? Who in Rodreda? Yeah, Rodreda. Yeah, sure. Uh, of course. Uh, what's the problem? In uh, schools and uh, literature, literature. No, how is it? Li- in liter- literature class. Tell me the word literature. Yeah, literature. Yeah. 
Ah, okay, then. Uh, it is mm, nearly forgotten. I mean, mm, nowadays uh, mm, it seems like it's, it's more important uh, science or uh, computing or things like that than literature. So, so uh, people uh, or, or students are not get, getting uh, to know writers. Uh, the Catalan writers, Spanish writers, Italian writers, French writers, but they, 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 could, they can end his or her their careers uh, without having opening more than a book. Well, that and makes that makes me it, feel good it, it, because uh, in in America we take literature class and we barely even read any literature in literature class. So, <laughs> no. you, you, you mean you, you, you do uh, literature class? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the students take literature class, but they still don't read and they don't know. No. Anything uh, yeah. or anyone other than Harry Potter or you know yeah, Game of Thrones. Yeah, yeah. Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't. Know. Of course, I'm uh, sixty-five or sixty-six years old. I don't know. Well, it depends if you count them uh, on those years on the Korean uh, calendar or the. <laughs> yeah, you know. That, that, that's, 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 <laughs> true. True. Yeah. I have 65, I'm 65 years old in the occidental uh, world, but if I go to Korea, I have 66. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm five and a half in dog years. Yeah, that, 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 that's the truth, that I'm not lying. Because when you are born, um, that's uh, here, well, that's, you have zero years. And then you have uh, one. You are one month old and two months old ah. and three. Six, blah, blah, blah. But in Korea, you are born. You are in the year one. So w when you write a curriculum vitae, uh, <laughs> the Koreans, uh, I don't know, but maybe if I was Korean, uh, I would be sixty-six. 66 years old then and then I would change my curriculum vitae uh, for occident for for, for 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 the western world B because uh, here I have 65 well uh, well what I mean is that uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, I was born in uh, in in that decade in the, the 50s and while well, I was young in the 60s and the 70s, and there was nothing ap apart from the for me to escape the the boredness of the of the, uh, the daily life. Books, 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 books. My, my mother. Well, I, I used to uh, be at my room with a math mathematics book covering a, an oval that I had uh, under the mathematics books. And when I hear, I hear, I hear, uh, I heard, ah, what's the pastor here? I heard. Her. And when I heard mm, my mother coming, I slipped the <laughs> novel under the mathematics books. But then she uh, saw it, and well, that, that was usual. They saw it and said, uh, it's like pornography. Uh, <laughs> You're supposed to be uh, hiding. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> but it was literature. No, they said, uh, she said, uh, tanto leer novelas, tanto leer novelas, acabarás idiota. Uh, reading so many novels, you will become a moron. <laughs> <laughs> she was, she was a, against being <laughs> for pleasure. <laughs> uh, it's the same that I found uh, later, when uh, 30 years later, when new kids uh, were you were watching TV. Ah, oh, you're watching TV. You became a moron. No, TV is great. Uh, maybe <laughs> there's a lot of rubbish. Of course, it's, it's a lot of rubbish, but. It's it's a form or, or, or a, a, a media to communicate uh, uh, fiction. See, nowadays, uh, uh, TV fiction, uh, the, uh, those series, no? how do you say yeah. serious? Serious, yeah. 
the, the yeah, television yeah. series, television shows, yeah, series are. Uh, <laughs> The, the, uh, the main, the core of the narrative, not even the, the, the cinema is it anymore. Yeah, that's very true. Speaking of, speaking of morons, do you, um, do you still wear your Thousand Morons t-shirt? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If anyone, yeah. anyone listening doesn't know, go look at the cover for A Thousand Morons. It'll be on this post. But uh, we made t-shirts out of those and... Uh, we use them for our soccer team for a long time. Those were our those were our jerseys. Was uh was the thousand morons t shirt, which has a nice fitting bra <laughs> drawn on yeah. it. Yeah. What what? Uh, as I'm getting old, I'm getting some uh, some tits, some man man <laughs> man tits. I don't know if, if you call this uh, uh, with man, that word. man man titties or man, man boobs. boobs. Yeah. That, yep. Those both yeah. work. Man titties. Uh, that, they are awful. When I wake, wake up and, and go to the shower and see myself. Uh, at the mirror, I, I, I think, oh my God, what, what have you become? Uh, uh, well, and then I put that picture <laughs> of a thousand more, and I feel that my tits <laughs> are, 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 are like like in a bra. They've <laughs> yeah. got a bra, and and that's uh, the uh, a thousand more than thousand. No, oh. hundred, hundred, not thousand, hundred a thousand. more picture. Thousand, yeah, yeah. That was oh god. I love, I love wearing that to the gym and having people just sort of look at me funny. So I just had uh, to circle back to Rhoda Reda. Um, what about her? Do, do you like so much in her writing? What, what about her? What? Uh, what about her writing? Uh, do, do you enjoy so much? Is there something in particular that you enjoy about her writing? Yeah, it was the air, the, the, the purity of the description. Uh, she wasn't baroque or, 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 or greasy. He was fine, uh, fine, um, subtle. Uh, they, there's some air, some clear air in what she's uh, writing. And then you go on uh, there, mm, what I told you, and she's not pushing you into thinking one thing or another. It, it, it's like a, like a river that flows, and you put yourself, uh, go into that river, and if you let go with that, uh, uh, how this is... Uh, so we have a lot of Spanish language uh, listeners. You can speak in Spanish or Catalan if you want. To describe that, uh, oh, the, the river is la, 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 la corriente, la, la corriente del río. How do you say that? That when a river goes on and on because it, it flows, the water flows from yeah. from. from yeah. And then if you go, if you put yourself in that flowing. Well, it's it, it, it's it's wonderful, brother. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's something uh, like like a, a little marble. Uh, it, it's strange, and well, uh, if if you know his life, when uh, she was married, I think to an to an uncle, I I, I think so, and she had a child, a son, uh, and. Uh, but uh, that marriage didn't uh, f- uh, fulfill her, so uh, she devoted to writing, and that, that's what more writers do, to to uh, uh, in order to, to not paying a, 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 sh- a shrink, uh, a, a psych- psychoanalyst. So you have those papers. You write all your obsessions, uh, and and you let your 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 rubbish go into into those pages and and, and create uh, something that uh, is useful for other people. I have one last question for you, which feel free to answer in, in Spanish, Catalan, English, whatever you feel like. Um, if you had to choose one book of hers or one story of hers, which one would you choose? Uh, of hers? Yeah. Wait a minute. Uh, I can't remember, but I don't know. I, I, I can't remember if one of them... Uh, 
uh, <laughs> it, it's it's very difficult. Uh, th there's one which is called I can't remember. I'm I'm getting old and here in in the in the uh, of my, the old people's home where I'm living now, and they 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 told me you you forget everything. They tell me you forget everything, but this one short story that's called Serafina. Serafina is Serafina, <laughs> but pronounced by a, pers by a person who has a, a, a little problem with, with, the, with the world, and uh, the, say the world in, <laughs> in a manner uh, different. And the whole story is written I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the, the name in English. In Catalan is Papisotas, and, and in Spanish I, I, I don't remember. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a person who, who, who said, um, in, you know, uh, instead of saying Serafina, says Serafina. Uh, <laughs> <And, laughs> all, 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 all the words she, she, she says uh, are. Um, uh, Expel using the, that that wrong wrong um, pronunciation, and that story is is is, is lovely. Well, is uh, because you you, you I, I say this because you told me to to, to try uh, to, to to choose one, but all of them and, and one of the stories helps the other. Uh, a, a, a good book of short stories uh, has. Uh, 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 has the 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 the, 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 the wonderful uh, situation that one story help, helps the other yes. and, and creates a, a world um, a, a cor a coral 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 see coral no yeah. the, the coral coral world world that's uh, behind the 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 the, 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 the simple short story. It's, it's one short story helps the other. This other short story helps the next one, and so and so so. Well, Quim, I agree. I think that was a very dumb question that Chad asked, um, <laughs> but it was very nice of you to answer it in such an eloquent way. But ask a better question next time, Chad. Jeez, we have a try. a master short story writer, and you're asking just pick one thing and just make it make it dumb for us. What's wrong, what wrong with you, Chad? We are wasting this man's I'm, time. I'm He's sad at this. Oh my god. We're, yeah, we are probably wasting your time. But um, what is that? A bar or what? Are you in a bar? Are, are you drunk? <laughs> I wish that was. I wish, we, yeah. I wish that was the excuse for really? my stupidity. Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel like we probably That's should be. I mean, it's afternoon here, so I, I also read a couple too many books and became a moron as well. I <laughs> yeah. think. Yeah, exactly. I spent all last night reading to making myself a moron. <laughs> I think that should be like the new slogan, like read books, make yourself a moron. You'll go blind Very if sick. you don't knock that off in there. <laughs> oh my God. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. This is really helpful and it's great to talk to you. Um, and I hope all goes well in, in Barcelona and Catalonia as a whole um, with all the independent stuff that's going on and with your, with your daily column, which God, God, help me. That yeah. seems like, that seems intense. And in all seriousness, uh, I, absolutely adore your short stories you're an amazing writer uh, quite an inspiration so keep up the good work my friend you, you are uh which a pilot in spanish they say pelota a person who who uh adulate no uh who who says nice things to another without really feeling it, it. oh god that's not true <laughs> I would honestly I, feel that. I, abs <laughs> I absolutely, absolutely love your writing. In fact, uh, the the very first time I read your your short stories, I just just got back from a writing conference, and so you're very. I was very uh, inspired to want to write, and after reading your stories, I didn't want to write anymore because they, come on. Because yours, yours were so good, I didn't want to write anymore. It made me feel like I was wasting my time. I think, I think one of my favorite stories is when we were in New York together years ago before we brought out A Thousand Morons. And, uh, and, you, and we were having a drink at the bar, and you're like, are you sure you want to do this book? And I was like, yeah, it's great. The stories are fantastic. They're funny. And you're like, but Chad, there are so many sad, depressed people in there. <laughs> so sad. Which, which bar was that? 
I don't remember where we were. <laughs> the, 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 the one uh, at uh, Ro the, the Roger Smith, I yes, think. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. But, but bad drinks there. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank but, you. But, 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 uh, the, 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 the cocktails were, well, but, but the whiskey was great. Yeah, very true, very true. Well, thank you so much again for everything. Okay, no, no, thank you. Oh, that was cool. That was great talking to him. Yeah, I don't think I understood anything of that entire conversation except for man titties, <laughs> which was very clearly in great English. So, uh, that's like the one. His best, his best word is man titties. It's, it's like when I'm trying to speak Spanish to people, and the only thing they understand is chinga tu madre, and they're like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, oh, I got it. Got I got it. that one. The rest of your rest of your Spanish is like a three year old. No, I loved. Uh, when he was talking about precision and being in the river of her pro, like, yeah, what a eloquent way of putting that. Like, absolutely. I wish I would have been able to speak those words in English <laughs> to, to describe her writing. Like he nailed it. I think he was very, the and, running of the river. Yeah, well that, like just yeah. like that, this, the, the rush of it and like the, the cleanliness of the prose. And then there is like some, some humor that's hidden in all this sorrow and angst, which, Oh, yeah, I tend to miss out on. Yeah, I mean, sort of focus too much maybe in my reading at, the, at these stories on like the the situation. Well, the you, situation. Had, you had told me you, did, you didn't believe women are funny and could be funny, <laughs> if I recall. No. We, after a couple of drinks, the truth came out that one time. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think women can be funny. I don't think Germans can be funny. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, that one. That one I'll stick by. Sober, sober or drunk, man. Um, German writers are just not funny. Uh, so should we, do you have a favorite line from this? Uh, you or, go first and I'll find one. I had a bunch. Um, oh, <laughs> wait a second. That one, that one I felt like was, was just not quite right. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, this was, this is <laughs> in light of everything that's been going on. This is still interesting. Now I'll I got it. one. There right. you go. You go. It's the, it's the, actually the last line from... Blood, my maybe my least favorite in the first five, but still had one of the best lines, I thought. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes when the weeds grow high, I pull them up and move the earth around so it won't look so bad. And if I see dahlias at the florist, a kind of dizziness sweeps over me and I feel like vomiting. Forgive me. Oh, man. Like, it's such a fantastic, powerful end with what the forgive me actually means in that line. Yeah. And then, you know, the trigger of... Dahlia is like just making her want to throw up because it reminds her of the relationship and all. Yeah, absolutely nailed it. This one, this is one of the ones. Okay, I'll choose this from the mirror because this is one of the parts where I think uh, it shows her starting to like really mature as a writer and figure out how to put things and make things complicated but straightforward. When I was alone again, I thought we'll never see each other again as we have today. I looked around for something to call my own: the light from the street lamp, the purple sky, a window with a light. Then I started walking, and later the dance, Agata, the child, my marriage. Wow, I like that. Which like condenses that whole story into like one little paragraph of like Roger, Roger and her relationship, which is really one night. Then trying to like hold on to that, and then the future is just downhill. <laughs> yeah, I love her use of sentence fragments yeah. right here. Which I don't know if that was popular at the time or not. I can't imagine that. Um, was. Everything. <sighs> I mean, I also think of, like, 1938 as being, like, before human existence, like, in some way. <laughs> yeah, like, this stuff wouldn't make it through an MFA workshop, because, well, the use of a fragment here, is it necessary or not? Maybe you should try a semicolon, because they look neat, and it means you're smart. <laughs> yep. So, can you throw a semicolon in there? None and... of these stories end with people overlooking, like, the future from a hilltop and having this grand realization that their life's going to be okay. So, I'm Na pretty sure that this is unpublishable. <laughs> Naval gazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyways, okay, so next week we will be talking about uh, the next five or six stories, I believe. It goes up to page uh, 103. Um, 51 to 103. This is covering a ton of stories. Afternoon in the Cinema, Ice Cream Carnival, Engaged, In a Whisper, Departure, and Friday, June 8th. Um, and so tune back in. Check in at the, the website. We are writing. I'm writing posts again, so there's more information. And you can buy this book and Death and Spring from openletterbooks.org by using two month, the number two, the word month, at checkout, you'll get 20% off. Also, rate us on, on iTunes. Tell your friends. If you if you have a chance, just, just grab their phone and sign them up to receive our, our automatically download our podcast. That would be cool. Do that, too. All right. And if there's shrimp, no SP.
paella, as we've learned from our... <laughs> no es paella. No es paella. <laughs> from our adventures in Catalonian culture. <laughs>